Hello and welcome to the Media Podcast. I'm Matt Deegan. On the show this week, never mind the PR, can media get better at the HR? Why looking after your talents could help your reputation. Uh, also on the programme, as US newspapers take open AI to court, we look at what the Financial Times is doing differently. All that plus we say farewell to the Reader's Digest, discuss the change at LBC, and in the Media Quiz, we play our most confusing game ever. Oh, God. Uh, That's all coming up in this edition of the Media Podcast. In the news this week, the Telegraph Media Group is officially back up for sale. Uh, after months of back and forth between the Competition Commission and the government, uh, Redbird IMI have walked away from the option to acquire the shares and the bidding war begins again, uh, with owners of GB News, Daily Mail and News UK all looking for a piece of the pie. Uh, the Mirror, meanwhile, has a new permanent editor and it's Caroline Waterston who has been filling in the role on a temporary basis since January. Uh, Waterston will have a well plenty of work to do, Uh, notwithstanding an election and potential change of government. A parent company Reach recently announced 700 job losses across its outlets. Uh, And Tortoise News' James Harding has expressed his frustration at BBC Sounds this week, telling a Lords Committee that ads on UK services would rebound badly for the BBC, uh, and that the app, uh, this is BBC Sounds, should be opened up to more third-party makers. Now, with me here in the London podcast studios, available everywhere except BBC Sounds, uh, we welcome back media writer Maggie Brown. Hello. Hello. Um, I haven't seen you since, well, uh, last week at the Voice of the Viewer and Listener Conference. So we talked about it a bit in the last show. Uh, did you think it was a good a good gig? A good I show? thought it was extremely good, especially in the morning. Um, and I think that the quality of both the speakers and the audience uh, really showed Um they have uh, a, a, a very good way of getting the people you want to listen <laughs> to into this extraordinary little place. And uh, I think that they do, in, in seri- I'm serious now, they actually do a great job uh, because they believe in the culture, really, of television, of trying to improve people's lives with the broad range of public service broadcasting. I'm sorry this sounds heavy, but that is why I think they're so much respected. Well, it's also nice to have the voice of the viewer and the listener and it is a uh it is a group who are interested in in radio and television um some of them with a media background some without and actually that's not a bad balance and also maybe a a bit of an older audience that perhaps oh it's always older yes don't normally get to hear from yes absolutely and of course remember they are 40 years old and so i mean mean, the organization Mm. is so they've actually come a long way from being almost a sort of counter to maybe Mary Whitehouse, Mm. um, in in considering the kind of quality television and radio, in particular Radio 4, that they wanted to um, become a a, a broader church. I I really do think they do um, a very valuable uh, job. Uh, And down the line, we welcome back Deadline International's investigations editor, Jake Cantor. Hi, Jake. Hello, hello. Good to be here. Um, I, I very much enjoy the VLV conferences as well, I have to say. And one of the best things about the VLV is is that audience members often know more about the services than the executives on stage, uh, <laughs> which always is uh, a brilliant dynamic. Uh, it is. Uh, now, Jake, in our January predictions special, uh, you felt that Alex Mann and Ian Katz would leave Channel 4 this year. Um, How is that looking? Can you perhaps give us... A Channel 4 health check on what you're you're hearing at the moment. Well, well, it hasn't happened, so it's wrong. Um, <laughs> do I think the chances of it happening this year are more likely as a result of what's happened over the last three months or so? Probably. Um, you speak to producers uh, and insiders at Channel 4, and there is an overwhelming... Um, anxiety about their leadership and people are agitating for change in a way that I've not really seen before uh, in the 13 years I've covered Channel 4. Uh, One producer put it to me this way that Channel 4 has, has lost the dressing room and people feel that it could do with a refresh and uh, a change of, uh, of leadership and a change of way of looking at things and yeah a bit of a creative refresh uh, and maggie you've been looking at channel four for a little while as well um what's your take on on the current top two well i agree that it's probably time that they do depart probably when they feel that they've um established enough of a change if you like it's is i think it runs more deeply though because 
the history of Channel 4 is always that you are not supposed to stay forever. I mean, Jake, you'll know that. That's how it started. The, the person who stayed longest, Michael Grade, in almost 10 years, had a very bad exit, really. And there haven't been brilliant exits <laughs> <laughs> all that well, except I think uh, preceding the current uh, group of people, we had um, in David Abraham, a very stabilizing figure who understood how to lead the move into into digital and, and to a different kind of arrangement of, of, of programming. And indeed, with Jay Hunt, they did establish some of the big hits that still just about remain with Channel 4. I'm thinking of Gogglebox, for example. So, yeah, definitely uh, I would agree that, we, that we're going to see change, but it's hard to know exactly when it is. Uh, Jake? I, I mean, I... I completely agree with Maggie. I mean, if you look at Jay's record, I mean, it's kind of astonishing, really. Um, a lot of Channel 4's biggest shows are from her era. Uh, you look at things like Bake Off and you look at things like Gogglebox and SAS, Who Dares Wins. These are still foundational shows in the Channel 4 schedule. And I think that's probably one of the biggest criticisms of, uh, of Ian Katz and Alex Mahon is that they have not ushered in that sort of new generation of ratings winners. They will point to The Piano, uh, which returned at the weekend with uh, 2.1 million viewers and does reasonable business for them. Um, but that's not on the scale of those shows that I've just mentioned. And um, there is a feeling that they need to work much harder to to, to bring in those kinds of uh, formats that can come back every year and be bankable. Uh, well, over at the BBC, um, uh, four female employees have faced an employment tribunal this week uh, as the former BBC News anchors took the corporation to court for redress. Um, I saw you tweeting about this um, earlier today. This is Thursday when we're recording it. Um, what's the first thing that we've heard from that from that case? Uh, so uh, it's been a two day hearing over Wednesday and Thursday this week. As we are speaking, there's just been um, some developments. Um, the preliminary hearing that took place uh, was to argue what could and could not go forward to the main tribunal, which will be at a date yet to be determined. The four women were arguing uh, to push forward a claim of uh, equal dis uh, equal pay disputes, but the tribunal has ruled with the BBC, has sided with the BBC and said that those claims cannot go forward. But the women have succeeded in being able to keep their cases together, which the BBC was trying to uh, prevent. This all looks like, you know, if it carries on this way, uh, this will be a pretty explosive tribunal if it uh, goes to a full hearing and is not settled. And we are going to hear some pretty uncomfortable allegations uh, for the BBC about uh, a recruitment process to hire chief presenters uh, for the news channel, which was uh, finalised in January last year. Maggie, I mean, th these things sort of come back to haunt channels when they're uh, dealing with staff, but also dealing with talent. Um, is it sort of any surprise that we're still facing these these similar responses? Well, you would have hoped that this was not happening. I don't think this is anything uh, that the BBC probably imagined was going to happen. They have been, I think, almost scared into making cuts because they have, as we know, also they say, uh, lost about a third of their revenue in real terms. It does seem to me very crass. And when you saw these four very presentable uh, women walking along and you know that they have done probably very good jobs for the BBC. It's it's a very hurtful experience, and I would have expected better from them, yes. Uh, Jake, does it point to any wider problems with how the BBC or broadcasters in general uh, deal with, with talent? I think this does point to issues at the BBC. Um, I mean, it's kind of staggering that uh, this has been dragging on for more than a year now, and we have reached this point. Um, I don't think that someone at the BBC senior enough has uh, seized this issue and said, we need to sort this and we need to sort it quickly. And that's how we've got to this point. These four women feel incredibly aggrieved at their treatment. They believe that the recruitment process was rigged and they were prevented from getting these jobs because 
Uh, the presenting lineup was predetermined before the recruitment process began. Uh, they're saying that they were harassed as a result of those decisions, that they have faced other discrimination in terms of their involvement with the union, and uh, they have uh, complained about physical and mental health detriments as a result of these decisions. And the, the optics uh, of four older women taking the BBC to court over these issues is, uh, I don't think can be un- understated how poor this is for the BBC. Um, I should imagine that the uh, events of the last couple of days will focus minds at the corporation. And um, I think it will be in the interest of all parties uh, to settle this and uh, and get these uh, you know, really strong professionals back on air. Well, at the risk of becoming a show about human resources, let's turn to the case of LBC's Sangeeta Maiska, who disappeared off air a couple of weekends ago, uh, with no acknowledgement from Global, leaving audiences to speculate over her dismissal. That was until this week, Jake, when uh, LBC announced a, a new schedule. Yeah, I mean, look, this is one of the more curious media stories that I've covered in quite a while. Um I think it's probably a bit of a parable of our times. Uh, you know, it shows how quickly conspiracy theories can fester uh, when there's an, an absence of credible information. Uh, the theory that's taken root online is that uh, Sangeeta Maiska was was fired for a robust interview with a, an Israeli government spokesperson. There's a couple of easy public counters to that. Uh, that you know, if Global is so desperate to censor this interview, then why has it been on LBC's YouTube channel for the past week? And, um, you know, there are other presenters on LBC being similarly robust with Israel, including, you know, its star man, James O'Brien. Um, I think it's true that Sangeeta's ratings um, have been uh, in decline, and that has been a motivating factor behind uh, Global's decision, according to people I've spoken to at the company this week. But I also think it's true that they have treated her in a really unnecessarily brutal way and shot themselves in the foot in the process. You know, they have been taken back by the listener response. I think they have found the conspiracy theories that have been going viral online incredibly unhelpful. Yeah, it's a really sort of unusual story of a presenter heading for the exit door. And I, I you know, I'm not sure that it's been handled brilliantly by Global. I mean, Maggie, I mean, Global can be quite a tough uh, operator. Yes. Um, and when I when I saw this story, my sort of immediate response was they just fancied a change to their schedule for whatever reason um, and made it. Um, as Jake says, that's been crashed into by people accusing them of, of uh, a variety of things. But does this point to the fact that companies maybe need to think more differently when they make changes to schedules for things that in the past they haven't well, really had to worry about. I think you're right. And we were previously talking about the um, Voice of the Listener and Viewer mm. conference. And a very similar thing was actually being aired there as well about local presenters and how attached certainly older people may be listening during the day as comp- you know having a companion, um, how much they were attached and how upset some of them have become when they're favourite presenters across the, uh, I think it's 23, or I can't mm. remember how many, ha- had disappeared. And we forget that that people do bond with voices and with an approach and maybe a, a sense of humour that they find both appealing and friendly, actually. The other thing I think about this, uh, the, the treatment, if I can go back to the, the four BBC uh, women, is that we had sort of Hugh Edwards also in another universe um, finally leaving but having had the comfort of um, extremely large um, paychecks mm. while he was, we hope, recovering. So it, it, the juxtaposition to me looks not just, it looks very awkward and, um, and it is upsetting, I'm sure, for a lot of listeners too who got used to those four women. I must say, I thought they looked terrific as they, as they walked in and uh, I, I was, was watching them and I thought <laughs> they looked very well groomed and they looked very determined. And I thought, well, watch out. Uh, well, it's quite interesting, isn't it, Jake, with this one? Um, in Sanjita hasn't said anything herself, uh, which has sort of driven a lot of the response as well. Uh, and again, my sort of just boring radio thoughts are um, they've probably paid off her contract till the end of it and given her an, an okay payout and as part of that to just stay stum on on anything connected to it because that's the normal playbook isn't it on these things 
I think that's very possible. But you had James O'Brien on the radio today. Uh, he was asked about uh, Sangeeta by a listener and basically said that her silence had not been very helpful and had allowed all these conspiracies to take root and she had declined to set the record straight. I think that was the phrase that he used. I'm not convinced that that's an entirely fair thing for him to be saying for the reasons that you've just articulated. You know, she will have a contract. I'm sure that contract uh, or whatever the terms of her departure are will say that she can't disparage global. Uh, so why would she risk um, that money and the potential to be sued by speaking out in favour or to help her her old employer? And also, if silence does make Global look a little bit bad, that's that's a little bonus positive for her as well, isn't it? By just <laughs> staying stum. Uh, Perhaps he'll, he'll not. I can't talk to her motivations, but um, yeah, I, yeah, I think it, as I say, it's it's a bizarre case. Uh, I'm not sure it's been particularly brilliantly handled. I think. It, it, what it does is it speaks to uh, Global's increasing uh, influence in the UK media landscape. I think it's become a really big and important player here in the UK, but it has still quite this sort of small-time uh, family business attitude to running things. And uh, those two things are sometimes in tension with each other, I think. Uh, well, on other changes to LBC, so Vanessa uh, Feltz uh, is uh, joining the station. She, You might remember that she left talk radio last week. We've got the news agents, Lewis Goodall, uh, replacing David Lammy, who not unexpectedly thinks he might be a little <laughs> bit busy over the next uh, uh, few months. Yes. Um, uh, I mean, Maggie, LBC is a growing national broadcaster um, and has had a good few years. Is it becoming a more important broadcaster for the election? Yes, definitely, because of the audiences mm. it, it attracts and the fact that it seems to be always there with, with, with the, as you say, there's been a sort of reliability of, of uh, presenters you mm. may or may not get used to. I think also that it's that people are listening on the move. They, 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 they have a number of ways of, of accessing radio, which even though we all have TVs and all the rest of it, it does, the, the kind of argumentative side of, of radio I mean, I find myself something, you know, you find yourself almost joining in sometimes and thinking, oh, gosh, you know, <laughs> and I, th I think that it, it's a live medium and it's and it's always reactive. It, it adds something to your day. And it is a very perfect. I, I agree that it has grown from a very small, you might say, base, but mm. it has become a national force, really. And, and that makes it really very important. No, I, I, I actually like the fact that it's it's not like the BBC, put mm. it that way. Uh, also, what's quite interesting, LBC was always the bad boy of broadcasting, and now it seems relatively staid in comparison to sort of GB News or, or, or Talk TV. That is, that is very true. And in fact, it, that's a very, very good point. They do try to... And I, I often think when they're having people, you know, calling in, they do, I think, often treat people with a degree of respect. Mm. They do listen to people, and they are prepared to... Uh, just stand back a bit and let somebody make a fool of themselves maybe but then come back in and that is a very they have they are, they do have very professional in their own style uh presenters that's what that i'm i find i, I actually do quite like lbc to be honest uh, i'm do. very much I'm, I'm i'm afraid i uh, the thing i don't like very much often now is radio 4 especially the today program i'm hoping for changes there well i, th I think when you are exposed to lots of other different types of ways to do radio or whatever media um, suddenly you look at the sort of old favorites and think oh maybe I don't didn't like it as much as I did I just never really saw anything else that out that's out there um, Jake um, a Sunday morning politics show uh, for Lewis Goodall that makes a lot of sense him him off of the news agents yeah I mean like, the news agents is clearly um, a part of global that's thriving um, it's doing really good business for them I think it's a, a, a fantastic quality product and uh, Lewis is um, is a real star, I think. I think he's, you know, a brilliant broadcaster, incredibly articulate and intelligent and smart and ha has clearly been plugged into different parts of the LBC schedule uh, for quite a while now. So to have his own show, I think, is, is a good step for him. I also actually think it's a good step for LBC to be moving away from David Lammy uh, and for David Lammy to be moving away from LBC, I think. Um, that has sort of become, I think it's a decision that suits both parties. It's sort of become uh, a stick to beat LBC with, that it's um, you know, giving uh, 
politicians the chance to present programs puts it in the same league as uh, GB News, and I'm not sure that the two are quite equivalent, uh, although equivalence is being drawn between them. And when we come back, uh, more about open AI uh, and the media quiz. Don't go anywhere. Uh, welcome back. Jake and Maggie are here. Uh, and we're talking um, about open AI and the US press because eight US newspapers, including the New York Daily News and Chicago Tribune, are suing Microsoft and open AI. Jake, uh, what's their beef? So they are basically saying, and I love, I, the reason I, I'm going to quote this directly is because I absolutely love this word and I'd not heard it before to, before reading this story today. But they're claiming that ChatGBT and Microsoft's uh, AI system, AI, AI system, is that that? I don't know. AI system co-pilot. Um, <laughs> they're claiming that it's purloining their content without payment. Now, I assume that means stealing. <laughs> It's a posh way of saying stealing. Um, <laughs> it's, it's and they're saying that their like language... It's dirty stuff. He's yeah. poined it off me. Yeah, he's poined it. Um, I, they're, they're saying that their language model near verbatim copies um, significant portions of their work. Um, and that's what's prompted uh, this uh, lawsuit. I, it should make out that all of these uh, newspaper publishers are owned by one hedge fund called Alden Global Capital. Uh, so there's uh, probably a reason why they're coordinating on this. But, you know, it's uh, a war I think that we're going to see more of in the future. We may see some bigger publishers um, taking similar action, or we may see uh, publishers doing what the FT has done uh, recently, and that's um, partner with OpenAI, uh, make its contact accessible, and presumably uh, generate some revenue from doing that. I mean, Maggie, the Financial Times approach, is that a more potentially profitable one for, uh, for, for news media? Absolutely. I mean, the Financial Times has fantastic content and it has extremely well-researched um, articles on a, on a far wider range of subjects, including a lot of foreign affairs, which uh, other papers now really resile from. So I, when I, I read the story and I, I, I thought about I was contrasting it, in fact, with the other way of doing it I thought it was a very smart move and remember too it, it includes their archives as well mm. or access to them now we all know and I mean I'm always kind of amazed I spent a, you know 40 years or something doing uh, different articles for people and sometimes mine pop up you know in the Guardian <laughs> and, and I, I, I link to a, a contemporary story and I, I kind of think oh you know and but it, but it has a, a bearing on, on the current story that, say, The Guardian is running, or it might be a, a feature. And so we all know in whatever sort of media content, it could be films or whatever, there are very often things that are of value long after they've first either been published or they've gone out. And I, I think with the Financial Times' backlog of, of things... Uh, it must have be sitting on some really very good properties, which which it can exploit. I think I I, I think that this is the intelligent way to go, and it was uh, the FT now has of course an, this big Japanese owner. It's got a global spread, and it will be increasingly I think backed by them because it has emerged as one of the of the global newspapers. So when you think about it. It can adapt with 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 new systems. Its its content can be translated into other languages. It can go back to stories which are say of in incredible interest to say South Africans, given the state, given the fact that they're just now facing a very important election. Things like that, which will 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 be for segmented audiences too, because of their global uh, reach. But with their own look at things, that they're not the same as. An American newspaper doing Wall Street type stories. They do global stories. So yeah, I think it's a very good move. I mean, Jake, isn't it good for sort of all of us really that they're doing licensing deals with good content providers uh, with, as Maggie was saying, they're a great back catalogue because it improves the algorithm. It improves uh, the material that it generates, improves, I guess, the service more and more of us will be using. Yeah, of course. Um, they should absolutely be mining uh, the treasure trove of journalism that is on the Financial Times and elsewhere, um, and not just for the good of users, but because it's like the morally 
ethical thing to do. They are breaching copyright by uh, using if they are, if they are using they. I'm sure they will deny this, but uh, by by using by taking content uh, without permission, they are potentially breaching copyright. And so, um, you know, it's more than just a a case of it being uh, good in the interests of its users. Um, one of the things that stuck out to me about. Uh, the Financial Times announcement was uh, the chief executive, John Ridding, saying the FT is committed to human journalism. Uh, that's not a phrase that any of us <laughs> <Yeah>. anticipated <laughs> hearing a few years ago, is it? <laughs> no, I, no, that was funny. and I, I, But I think it, it, it kind of is, it just shows the way they're not quite the same as, say, the Mirror or the Daily Mail. Yeah. You know, th- that's a sort of very uh, kind of chief executive sort of uh, way to put it. I, no, I, I, th- anything that strengthens what we might call even now the newspaper industry or proper Heritage journalism. Heritage, heritage journalism is the word I'm looking for. <laughs> then I'm completely in favour of it. I think there's something also quite interesting. Um, for some of the things that I do, uh, we use some AI services, particularly around imagery. Uh, and the one that I've sort of landed on is Adobe's AI stuff or a subscriber to Adobe. And they say that they have all the rights uh that they've all the stuff they've licensed to put into it is things they've licensed and for me as a as a publisher myself i think well i'm not going to get caught out that something they snaffled a bit dodgily three years ago won't suddenly pop up in one of my header images i mean that's the other thing is chat gpt has got to be able to prove that to its paying customers that uh the stuff is not going to catch their customers and get them in trouble that's a very good point so speaking of uh, publishers that could be in trouble um, and definitely are in trouble, uh, the Regis Digest is no more, uh, at least in the UK anyway. Uh, after 86 years, uh, the magazine stopped publishing last week. Um, Maggie, the previous incumbent of this chair, Ollie Mann, was a regular columnist um, and he was on ITV's Evening News on Wednesday uh, talking about it. Uh, so there's clearly a, a huge amount of brand recognition from people, uh, but they just they'd stop buying it. Well, I, I was I, I was kind of sad in a way because it was a, a mainstay of my father always had it, and um, he he I think he he liked the fact that you could pick it up, and there were relatively short articles in it, and so yeah, it, it accompanied him. Say on a holiday, mm. he would always have it, and you no, know, he subscribed for as long as <clears throat> he was alive actually. So yes, so, so I, I grew up with it, and I don't really think I read it, but it was always there. And I, th- one thing that did happen to me was that I actually knew a couple of the people in latter years who were either the running it or one was doing the European side of things. And I had a particular nasty experience, which was a burglary, which uh, they commissioned one of them commissioned me to write so I've actually written for them and they they paid me fantastically <laughs> well I think it was 1500 pounds maybe this is the problem maybe that that's what led them down this path. I mean I, I remember I used to my grandparents would get it as well and so I guess as a 10 year old would would enjoy reading the short things um all, all the little sort of funny bits in do you, there. yes and do you remember they also used to do condensed books that mm. was another thing it was a very strange thing in other in other words you would say pick up a dickens book and instead of it extending to i don't know a thousand pages or something you would get the core of it so you had an easy to read condensed book and they had a whole team that did it I, I remember visiting them and I and I thought I wonder how long this is going to go on for <laughs> well this is one of the challenges of, of models kind of drifting I think and its peak it had about 1.6 million subscribers and or sales here in the UK um, Jake it seems uh, again that the staff were the last people to find out that um, uh, the thing was closing that's um it's a shame there's not going to be any scope for a sort of final commemorative issue. Yeah, that's massively unfortunate. I mean, Ollie said on LinkedIn that he found out via a LinkedIn post uh, that it was closing, mm, having goodness. written his column for a long time. I presume Ollie had nothing to do with the fact that readers were uh, were fleeing in their <laughs> droves. Uh, one of the things I loved uh, reading the obituaries uh, for Reader's Digest is it uh, is it this idea that it was sort of one of the first places to give rise to what we now know as sort of internet meme culture. You know, it was a place where there were lots of cat pictures and photos of clouds that looked like celebrities, 
which obviously is <laughs> <laughs> fuels our existence online these days. Uh, it was a forerunner. Well, uh, RAP to the Reader's Digest. Uh, okay, just enough time for the media quiz. Uh, this week, it's entitled The Two Ronnies Mastermind Sketch, but as a quiz. Uh, I'm going to give you a question, but you have to answer the question before. Uh, so, buzz in with your names if you know the answer. So, Jake, you will say... And Maggie, you will say, let's play the two Ronnies mastermind sketch, but as a quiz. Uh, right, question number one. Who has Universal Music signed a new deal with to allow its artists back on its platform? Jake. Correct. Question number two. Which TV ser- series originally Project Kangaroo launched this week? Jake. <laughs> yes. Uh, TikTok. <laughs> Uh, Yes, that's right. Uh, And question number three, which award-winning British comedy starts its final series this week? I do know the answer to this, but I I wanted to... So it's Jake. Jake. Oh, no. It's uh, it's Freely, isn't it? Is that that the answer? Freely TV, correct. Yes. (laughs) Uh, And now question number four, uh, who is the real baby reindeer? Maggie. Uh, Yes, Maggie. Um, Inside number nine. Yes, correct. Uh, uh, And that's time's up. And I think that (laughs) makes Jake our winner for a thing we will never do again, producer Matt. (laughs) I think you did. You did. You did a good job there. Um, Pick up with some of those. Um, uh, Jake, what do you make of the baby reindeer controversy? Oh, it's kind of extraordinary, isn't it? Um, This show uh, landed with like kind of no marketing uh, with no fanfare whatsoever and has absolutely exploded on Netflix. I mean, it is doing absolute gangbusters, not just here in the UK, but internationally and in America. And listening to uh, The Rest is Entertainment uh, with Richard Osman and, and Marina Hyde earlier this week, they made some really good points about uh, compliance and whether Netflix did enough to make sure that the identities uh, of the characters portrayed in this drama were protected enough. And given that the stalker, uh, the, the, the the series is about a comedian who is stalked by a woman and it's based on a true story and the identity of the, uh, the, the, the stalker character has been outed by internet sleuths and uh, she's, you know, done an interview with the Daily Mail in which she's talked about being victimised and uh, being taken advantage of. Um, so it's all a bit messy. I mean, there's something that's that, that quite interesting thing in the piece about the nature of stalking. And they have sort of inadvertently created a witch hunt that is very much like stalking. I mean, it's a sort of very modern problem. But Maggie, as Jake was saying, um, this is something that Netflix probably could have guessed would happen, you would have thought. Well, I mean, are Netflix upset about this uh, huge interest that they've they've generated? It seems to me, I, I, I when I was reading about it, it seemed to me like a sort of whodunit, you know, trying to sort of, I think they've deliberately almost made it a question hanging in there. It hasn't Nigel Farage um, I don't know. He's entered the... the He's entered the chat. Everybody enters all of the, <laughs> Never one to miss a good opportunity. Yeah, it, 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 is, it is a strange one. And, I mean, the Richard Gadd had to basically do a social post last week saying that someone else wasn't the person for the thing that happened in episode four. I mean, it's all got, it's all got a bit complicated, hasn't it, Jake? It has. Um, I mean, look, I think the starting point is it, it's a it's a... It's a stunning and quite remarkable bit of television, I think. Um, An incredibly raw story told brilliantly. But I really, uh, as I say, I do think there are questions for Netflix and the way they've handled this. I think if it was on the BBC, there wouldn't be this kind of uh, internet guessing game because the BBC would have done a much better job of protecting the identities and uh, providing uh, probably a better duty of care to all of those involved. And also we, t- we touched on Freely there. Uh, Freely is um, the sort of sequel to Freeview and Freesat run by Everyone TV. Uh, it's an IP version of kind of watching live telly. Do you think it's got a good chance of a success, Maggie? Well, why not? I, I think it's a, an addition, isn't it? And it's broadband based, yes. isn't it? No, I mean, uh, we all know that they did Freeview pretty well, actually. So it's just a development on that. And it, it shows that they're still in the game, really. Mm. They're, they're, 
they have a, a it's the four public service broadcasters coming together as before plus i think what are the, the 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 two language services as well yes so yeah uh, why not uh, and jake um i was reading a bit about it this week uh, they've talked a lot about freely being available in sort of tvs you can go and get a tv with smart tv yes with uh, freely in uh, but it's not sort of available as an app yet um it's you've got to buy one of those, those tvs are they a bit behind the game or do you think this is the right time for a a PSB uh, IPTV service. If they are behind the game, then they're not necessarily entirely to blame, given that uh, something quite similar in Project Kangaroo was blocked by the government, you know, a, more than a decade ago before streaming mm. was a re- really a thing. I think it makes complete sense for uh, these organisations to come together and, and, and do something like this. They probably are a little behind the curve, but uh, this probably is a fairly inexpensive way of bringing themselves together and, and um, trying to increase their scale. And it get, gets around this issue that some people really don't want to take out subscriptions. Yes. So it's designed really for the ordinary viewer who wants to have that kind of service. And so I, I don't think something that's offered th- offered freely, literally for free, <laughs> given if you've got to have the right TV, yeah. uh, is, is going to flop. It's going to be taken up. It probably won't change the world. But as in, if, if, for example, it had happened in 2007. But <laughs> it's, de- <laughs> it's definitely an addition. And good, good on the public service broadcasters, I say. Uh, well, congratulations, um, Jake, for winning the quiz. Uh, a high sense freely TV is definitely in the post to you uh, right now, I'm sure. Uh, Thank my thanks to Maggie Brown and Jake Cantor. Um, Jake, where can people keep track of what you're up to? Uh, I am on X at Jake underscore Cantor and um, yeah, check out deadline.com. Uh, and Maggie? Well, actually, I'm going to be in America for the next month, so probably... You can't catch up with her. You're having <laughs> a lovely time. I'm going, I'm going to be having... Well, yes, I am going to have a lovely <laughs> time, but yes, I am, I am on X as well. Uh, well, send us a postcard. Uh, thank you both. Bye-bye. That's it for today. Remember, there's 25% off your first booking at the London Podcast Studios, where we record our show every week when you use the code MEDIAPOD. Uh, Just head to thelondonpodcaststudios.com for 25% off when you use the code MEDIAPOD. Uh, And if you're new to the show, remember to hit follow so you get every episode in your podcast app of choice. Uh, My name is Matt Deegan. The producer is Matt Hill. It was a Rethink Audio production. And I'll see you next week.